everyone. My name is Garrett and I am the founder of Ambition in Motion and I'm so excited. I'm so grateful to have you here for our first workshop. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so glad that you've decided to invest in yourself to build a mentoring relationship with someone from your organization so then you can help amplify your own career prospects and opportunities to really help take your career to the next level. I'm really excited for you and what you're going to accomplish over these next four months. So during this video, I just wanted to give you an overview of what to expect for the program and how to prep for this upcoming workshop. Now this workshop's title is called Transitioning into a Managerial Role. So maybe you're in your career and maybe you're about to start entering into a managerial role or maybe you've been a manager for a while or maybe you're not a manager quite yet but you will be. This workshop will be extremely insightful for you. You are going to learn a ton about management and how to properly manage somebody and how to not properly manage somebody. If you have any questions throughout this workshop, please post them in the comments section. So I wanted to give you first an idea of the timeline of the program. Tonight is the first workshop. So pumped about it. All of our workshops are, by the way, going to start at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Pacific, and any time in between if you're somewhere in between in the United States. Our goal is that you have at least three meetings with your mentor, but ideally you meet more. Ideally, you meet more often than that. If you think to yourself, oh, I should wait, or I should wait for this to happen, or I should wait for that to happen, don't. Get on it right away. Build that relationship. I strongly encourage that because the longer you wait, the more time you're putting off from building a great mental relationship and the more time you're putting off from actually really seeing the results and being able to apply what we're teaching in these workshops into your life. So have multiple areas of support. Take advantage of your mentor. Start building that relationship. Now, those four workshops are the first ones on transitioning to a managerial role. The second one is determining when is the right time to pursue additional education or if it's the right time to pursue additional education. The third workshop is determining when is the right time to switch jobs. And the final workshop is on how to handle conflict in the workplace. So the really relevant topics, and I think that you're going to really enjoy these workshops and the guest speakers that we brought in for you to learn from during these workshops. We will send you a post-program assessment to get your feedback. So this workshop is going to be roughly an hour long and we're going to cover a lot of topics on how to transition into a managerial role and so for you my focus is on how can you go about making the most out of this. Really the best way to go about making the most out of these workshops is to interact with us. When I ask a question to you the audience viewing this, answer it because here's the thing. I would rather you post your questions in the comment section because if you got this question I guarantee you somebody else in the audience does as well. So if we were to answer questions on an individual private basis, we're not really answering everybody's questions. But if you post your questions in the comment section, we can share this with everybody so then they can get their answers just like you got your answer. This program doesn't guarantee you a promotion or a new job. Uh, really, the key is this program's for professionals who want to take their career to the next level. Like, we don't hand things out on a silver platter. Now, by the way, do these types of opportunities happen for the professionals that use this program? Absolutely. But you got to be open to it. You got to be willing to put your time in to go ahead and, and make the most out of this experience. If you're thinking to yourself, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to come in negatively, negatively or skeptically, you're going to get negative and skeptical results. I mean, it's the law of attraction. If you come in with a negative mindset, you're going to manifest a negative mindset. If you come in with a positive mindset, you're going to manifest a positive mindset. It's all about how you view this system, this workshop, this opportunity. So come in with the right idea, with the right mindset, and you can make the most out of this experience. I promise that. So I just want to set the expectation properly. This is a program that does not hand out things on a silver platter. If you work for them, you can absolutely take your career to the next level, but it's about applying them. It's about actively meeting with your mentor. It's about actively networking and actually doing what you can to make the most out of this experience. Ask questions, interact, take advantage of everything we've got for you, and you will get the opportunities you desire. I mean, that's what is, this program's here for. If you think like, oh, I'm gonna do the bare bones minimum, I'm just gonna kinda have just three phone calls and you know, we'll keep them at the minimum length of time and I'm just gonna attend the workshop, not take any notes, not really make any comments, not really talk to anybody about what I'm learning. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna get those types of outcomes. That's pretty much it. So I just, I really wanna encourage you to make the most out of this program, take advantage of it, ask questions, participate and interact. Treat this program as fuel. Treat this program as fuel to help you get to where you want to be. If you're already burning, going strong, going hard, this program can help you get into the next level and accelerate. If you're barely burning a fire, barely burning an ember, and you really want to rekindle that and get yourself up, take advantage of it. Jump in. But if you think to yourself, you know what, I, you know, I'm barely burning this ember. I'm not really trying to, to burn this ember. Really, there's nothing there. 
you know, the field can only do so much for you. So the point I'm making is come in with an open mind and a willingness to work hard and you can achieve what you want. I mean, have professionals use this program to gain a managerial role or negotiate a raise or build deep bonds with their colleagues or expand their networks? Absolutely. But did those outcomes come, come handed on a silver platter? No, they didn't. It's about how you can apply what you're learning in this workshop to make the most out of this experience. So I want to share with you a little bit about my background because I think that helps give some context as to who I am, what we're teaching, what we've learned, and why this information is relevant. Um, so for me, I personally needed mentors in my life. Um, and, and this might sound crazy, but from age 15 to age 19, I was a drug dealer. At the end of my freshman year at Indiana University, I got arrested in an undercover operation by the Indiana University Police Department, and I got five felony distribution charges. I was expelled from school, and I had no idea really what I was going to do with my life. It hit my life like a brick wall. I mean, up to that point in time in life, I thought success was you go to school, you get good grades, you get a job, and then you just kind of find yourself, like as if it's, as if it's puberty, it just comes and hits you. Um, and nobody that I had ever known that I ever thought was successful ever was a drug dealer. So I either had to accepting a failure or redefine my definition of success. So I, I chose the latter. And it was a great decision for me, kind of like back to the whole law of attraction thing. I opened my mind to what positively could happen from this situation as opposed to negatively. Um, so I enrolled in a program in St. George, Utah after I got in trouble. And they exposed me to the power of mentorship, both on a personal level and a professional level. On a personal level, they were huge. I mean, they helped me come to grips with how I'd affected my family, my friends, my university, my country. I really didn't think that what I had done really would impact anybody or that anybody would care. And that was so wrong. And I really don't ever want to discount the power of personal mentors because personal mentors can really help you make some serious just strides and, and have some serious growth in your life because ultimately those personal mentors can help see you for you. And don't get me wrong, the professional mentors are amazing as well. And by the way, we can mix those two. They can both be personal and professional mentors. But I just, I really want to stress the importance of being vulnerable in a mentoring relationship, just like I've been vulnerable with you right now sharing my story because I know that when you're vulnerable, you're much more likely to be attractive in that relationship. You're much more likely to build trust. I mean, shoot, you can't even build trust without vulnerability. You have to have vulnerability. So when it comes to building a mentor relationship, I hope me sharing my story with you has helped inspire you to, to be vulnerable with your mentor and in your mentoring relationship. And just to kind of finish out my story in terms of how I actually got here from being a drug dealer who moved to St. George, Utah. Um, about a month after living in Utah, I flew back to Chicago for the weekend to let my family know my life's getting on track. On that flight, I'm sitting next to a guy. I took a keen interest in who he is. I asked him questions, I took down notes, shared with him a little bit about me, but really I was focused on who he was and asking him questions and really learning about what he had to say because people love to talk about themselves. I was learning that through a book I was reading called Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And by the time we landed, he said, oh, by the way, I'm the director of ground equipment for SkyWest Airlines. And he offered me an internship doing financial analysis on the spot. Didn't care about my background. He decided to take me under his wing and give me an opportunity, and that was so crucial. That was so that was amazing. Um, he didn't care that I might be going to prison sometime in the future. He didn't care really what my future looked like. He cared about me, and he wanted to give me a chance, and that was so crucial. It helped me really take some serious strides in my life and my career. Um, about a year after living in Utah, I actually got very lucky. Um, while I was in Utah, I started a nonprofit to help young men and women who had made poor choices with drugs and alcohol and help them get mentors too, just like I had gotten mentored by that guy at Skywest Airlines. And the court system saw that. They ended up dropping my felonies to a misdemeanor conviction. Indiana University had decided to re-enroll me, and I started Ambition in Motion with the idea of how can I help people get connected with their careers. I mean, ultimately for me, my vision is a world where the vast majority of people, not a couple people, but the vast majority of people are excited to go to work. When they're there, their expectations meet reality. And when they come home, they feel fulfilled. I'm here to try to help you achieve that. That's all I do is to help serve you, to get you to where you want to be in your career. Because the more satisfied you are with your career, the better of a society we live in. And the more happy society is, the better everybody's lives are. I don't know. That's just my way of trying to make an impact on the world. And, you know, if you're going through this right now as a professional and you're thinking to yourself, like, what is my impact on the world? You know, it could be anything. But I think if you're consciously aware of that and think to yourself, I want to make an impact on the world, that's a great starting point. So the point is, 
be vulnerable and think about your impact, especially as it comes to, as it pertains to your story. Now, I want to talk about three keys to success for this program. The three keys to success for this program are honing your strategy, your story, and your state. Now, I said those in reverse order of importance. Your state is number one. Physically, what is your state? Like your physiological state. Are you like amped up? Are you ready? Are you good to go? Are you in such a good mood that you, you're going to take on the world? Or are you stressed out, uh, hunched over your computer, got bad posture, not feeling great? I mean, your first impression is everything. And when you're going to your mentor meeting or a meeting with anybody for that matter, and you're coming in with some bad body language, I can promise you, you are not going to have a good first impression and that will kill that relationship. It is very difficult to overcome a bad first impression. So fortunately, there are some things that you can do to help you get yourself into a positive state. And they take like 30 seconds because your emotions drive your emotions. Now, you might have had the worst day in the world. You might be thinking to yourself like, oh man, I got to meet my mentor right now. I don't know how I can do this. Here's something you can do to get yourself into a positive state. There's a lot of things you can do. You can do a power pose. You can fake smile for 30 seconds. You could fake laugh for 30 seconds. But what I like to do is I like to shake it out and I like to dance it out and I like to scream at the top of my lungs. So what I want you to do right now while you're watching this video, and I know it might sound crazy, you might be in your house, you might be in your office, you might be at work, I don't really care. Stand up, shake it out, shimmy it loose. Stand up, I want you to scream at the top of your lungs. Just go, yeah, just let it loose, let it out, let it go. And the reason why I'm telling you to do this is because you are releasing endorphins to your brain, getting blood flowing to your brain. What this does is it gets you into a positive mood. It takes you from wherever you're at and puts you at a 10. It gets you ready to go. And your physical body, your physiology, your body is saying, thank you, I'm ready for this, I'm ready to take on the world. Your state is crucial. So when it comes to a mentor meeting, get your state right. You're going to give a first, positive first impression if you get your state right. <laughs> if you're screaming at work, good for you, amazing, I'm proud of you, that's awesome. You know, people might think of you and look at you like a weirdo, but that's okay because this is not a coolness contest. This is about you making strides in your career and getting a positive first impression with your mentor and with anybody that you want to meet. Now the second key is your story. Now what's a story that you tell yourself? Do you tell yourself a story for why you won't be successful or, or for why you will be successful? I mean, your story could be, oh, well, you know, I'm an introvert, so I couldn't possibly be good at networking or putting myself out there or trying to get a raise or try to be a manager because, you know, I, I, uh, I'm just an introvert. Or, or maybe you think to yourself, like, I'm an extrovert. I'm crazy around people. I can't even handle it. I'm a word vomiter. I just can't even contain myself um, around other people. I couldn't possibly be good at networking or in a managerial position. If you tell yourself a story for why you will not be successful, you will not be successful. But if you tell yourself a story for why you can be successful, you can manifest that outcome. If you tell yourself a story, if you literally play in your mind how a situation could go the most positive way it could possibly go, you will get yourself to where you want to be. So I want to ask you right now, and I want love if you could post in the comment section, what is a story that you tell yourself for why you will be successful? Where do you want to go? What do you want to achieve? How are you going to do that? Lay out your story of where you're going. It could be the next three months. It could be the next year. I don't really care, but put it out there for how you're going to be successful. Share it with the world. Share it with your community here because what that does is it empowers other people to be vulnerable and share their story as well. I'd love if you could share your story of where you want to go in the comment section. Now, the last key is your strategy. So what is the strategy that you're going to do to help you get to where you want to be? Now this workshop is all about how to transition into a managerial role. So the strategy is going to be all about how can you go about becoming a better manager. Now take the skills that we're teaching in this workshop with our guest speaker. Take these skills and apply them. One of the things that I love to do when it comes to strategy is to set up a routine. So what is something that you can do on a regular basis to help you reinforce this skill that you're learning in this workshop because if you're just here in this workshop and you're just watching this video and you maybe you're taking notes like that might stick but if you actually teach it to somebody else that is definitely going to stick exponentially you are much more likely to remember the information that you're taught if you teach it to somebody else so what i want you to do when it comes to strategies i want you to take what you're learning during this workshop and i want you to apply it and teach it to somebody else this could be a friend it could be a stranger i don't really care but teach something that you learned that you thought was impactful and powerful to you. 
I love if you could do that because if you can, you're going to reinforce this information and this, this program, this workshop, this whole experience is going to be so much more powerful to you because you are reinforcing what you are learning. So the way that you can practice, find an accountability partner, teach them the skills that you are learning, something that you learn, and it could be anything. Like whatever nugget of wisdom that you heard from me or from our guest, teach it to somebody else. That will help you reinforce it. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited for you to embark on your mentor relationship. And in this mentor program, I'm really excited to get started with our guest speaker. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our workshop this evening. I'm so excited to dive into our topic. That is, how do we transition into management? We're in such a fascinating time period right now where we've got this crazy point in the world where we've got COVID, we're probably, we might be in positions where we're working remotely or hybrid, um, or maybe we're working in the office, but it's a very different work dynamic than it was when we were working pre-COVID. Um, and I would imagine that handling the sometimes politics, handling the corporate trajectory, handling the organizational hurdles that one needs to handle to get themselves to a level of management is, is a little bit different than what it used to be. Fortunately, we've got an incredible guest with us here this evening. We've got Allie Bedwell. Allie is the Vice President of Brand Strategy for Skyline Enterprises. She's responsible for the overall corporate brand of Skyline's family of companies, which includes six real estate and commercial construction companies throughout the United States. She is passionate about aligning external perceptions with internal brand awareness to create a consistent, memorable experience for customers, employees alike. Allie, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So, Ali, you've been at Skyline for a little while, and you, from my understanding, you kind of started from the ground up and worked your way into more and more responsibilities. Could you, I know I kind of give a little bit of a background on you, but would you mind just maybe diving in deeper into how you got to where you're at today, how you, where you got started, and kind of like, how did that promotional track kind of add up? Sure. So, I've been at Skyline for almost 14 years. Um, it was my second job out of school. So I worked as an individual contributor as a graphic designer for a year at a different company before moving over to Skyline. And when I joined Skyline, I was a one person marketing department. And over the last 14 years, we've grown it to become a seven person department with plans over the next five years to grow up to 20 people. So um, big growth anticipated and a lot of transition at the moment. But the career path for me was simply from a marketing coordinator to a manager and backfilling the position under me and then continuing to slowly grow as the company grew, taking on more responsibility. And today where I sit, I really don't even consider myself, while I oversee the entire marketing engine, I'm not personally doing any marketing today. My role is really all about empowering my team and motivating people to, to produce great marketing results. That's really cool and interesting. I want to dive into the nuts and bolts of that. So a lot of students, they're in college right now. And don't get me wrong. Everybody would love to work for a company that immediately takes off like a rocket ship and grows and grows and grows. That would be awesome. But that doesn't actually happen to everybody. Did you know that Skyline was going in the direction that they were going? Or like, I don't know, I think a lot of companies say that they're poised for a lot of growth, but how did, did you know that or was it kind of just happenstance that it worked out this way? It was luck in some ways, but it was also intentional. So the company that I had worked for previously was a large national um, commercial real estate brokerage firm. And I was one small graphic designer in a huge marketing and creative engine. And I knew that my next role, I wanted to work for a small company because I think in a small company, you can make a really big impact. You can get to know everybody and you have, in my opinion, the opportunity to carve your own career path and create a plan for yourself that works for your needs rather than coming into a really large company where the career tracks are already predefined and you're just one cog in a large machine. So I did seek that side out, but yeah, you're right. You, some of it is pure luck in finding an organization that says they're going to grow and then truly has the leadership to make that happen and the financial backing and the customer acquisition and everything else you need in order to truly scale. So in those early days at Skyline, like how many employees were there then and how many employees are there now? Well, it's interesting. So I started it in the end of 20, uh, the end of 2007. 
And mid 2008, we hit the great recession. And so when I started, we were about a hundred people. And when the economy tanked, we went down to 50. And so in 2008 through 2012, we were incredibly lean. And then from 2012 to now, we've just seen this massive upward trajectory. Um, but that, that recession in 2008 was really an opportunity to make sure that the people that stayed in the organization were the right people to help scale the company for future growth. Did you ever have any concerns that you were on like kind of the chopping block when that happened? Absolutely. Um, working in the construction industry, marketing is, is often seen as both an administrative function and as simply overhead because they don't fully understand that function. So I felt like I was constantly trying to prove my worth and validate the skill set that I was bringing to the table. I think the one good thing for me at that time, like I said, is I was a one person department. So if they were going to get rid of me, they were going to essentially deem that the marketing function within the business wasn't necessary. So um, I had that working towards my advantage. Well, that's interesting because if you were hired in 2007, was there a marketing person there before you? There had been um, an administrator who doubled as a marketing professional, but with no formal training or background. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. That's interesting. So you have these tough time periods, company scales down, but then you're about to grow back up in, in 2012. Is that right around the time that the company started investing in more marketing and allowing you to bring on additional people to help out? And yes. if that's a yes, how did they go about determining that you were the right person to lead that team? I mean, I know that you had been there for a while, but as you said, you don't do really any marketing right now. You lead people. And that's a very different skill set for marketing. How did they determine that you were the right person to lead this team? So I think so naturally I am a people person. And I think what had happened over time is that I, I recognized in need that nobody was owning the culture of the organization. Nobody was focusing on internal marketing initiatives to rally the troops, to make a cohesive work environment, to make it a best places to work organization. And so I just saw that need and took it on myself. So even though at that point I didn't have any direct reports, I was still managing both functions and organizing people in a way that our CEO deemed could be translatable in scaling a department. That's really interesting. So you took that initiative on your own to go ahead and do that. I don't think most people do that. I think a lot of people when they're entering their first jobs are kind of like, I'll do what you tell me to do. But when it comes to like building culture or that sort of thing, that isn't as intuitive. What how did you know to do that? Like who taught you? Who showed you? How, like, did you go to conferences? Like, what did you learn that you were like, okay, we're not doing this. We need to do this. And let's get started on that. Like what, what drove that? So I think for me, a lot of that came down to what I needed at work. So, and I think about the reason I stay at an organization and why I want to be somewhere. It's because I want to add value to an organization. I want to be recognized and I want to have fun. And, and those two things were happening. I was feeling valued and recognized, but we were not creating opportunities for people to connect and have fun. And I just felt that if I was going to stay, those things needed to happen and I needed to take the initiative. Now, wind back. Um, I had, I had done a lot of leadership classes, activities, exercises, from high school all the way through college. Um, I was the president of an honor society. I was very heavily involved in the Greek system and and in philanthropy organizations. And so I had dabbled in in some leadership in the past and I had the confidence in myself to just see the need and know that it was necessary and, and tackle it. That's cool. That's interesting. It's kind of crazy to think like, they seem like such obvious almost experiential opportunities, but most people don't do that. Like most people don't take that kind of initiative within an organization. I guess I love to learn, what would your advice be right now for any students or or young professionals or early professionals in their career that are looking for some of that guidance as to, you know, taking some of that initiative, even if they're not asked to be a manager of people, what are some things that they can do now to maybe get that kind of experience? So maybe they weren't the president of their honor society or they're not in a position where they can do that, but can they be president or take on leadership roles in other areas of their life? And if so, how? 
So I think the, the reason I see people not taking initiative is not because they don't want to, but because they're worried about the what ifs or the barriers that get in their way. And so removing those barriers, right? So if, if you have a passion for something and somebody is blocking you from doing it, find another way to go about doing it or start it in a smaller way. Um, also bite off manageable pieces. You don't have to, you don't have to do everything overnight. Um, find something you're passionate about and just do it in a small way by rallying a couple people to participate in an event. It doesn't have to be office sanctioned. Um, every little thing that you do as an employee is seen by the people around you and they'll start emulating behaviors as well. Um, or it'll be noticed by management and you'll receive recognition, which can lead to then sitting on additional committees outside of your role. So I guess my, my biggest piece of advice is remove any barrier, whether that's in your head or, or in real life, to be able to take on things in small ways. I think that head trash plays a massive role in our yes. lack of ability to take initiative because we have fear the what if, what if, what if. I mean, like what if you end up becoming president of some volunteer organization or like what if you end up initiating some group get together for team members and only three people show up like at the end of the day it doesn't need to be the entire company it doesn't need to be this smashing success i mean you know i don't know what your thoughts are on this this quote but uh, i think the quote is perfect is the enemy of progress like if we think that we have Absolutely. to be perfect we're never actually going to take any steps forward on anything because it's, it's not perfect. Nothing's ever perfect. You just have to try. And every failure leads to a learning lesson that helps you prevent making that same mistake again. So if you start looking at it as, as every opportunity is a learning lesson, instead of every opportunity has to be perfect and failure is not an option, it changes your perspective. I think another big factor in all of this is what are your thoughts on just like on the accountability side of things? Like, you know, what if you were to say, Hey, I'm going to throw a pizza party for everybody you want. We're going to have a discussion or like, maybe we're going to have uh, like, for, so one, one company that we worked with um, we facilitated like a mentor program with the company and two women we paired together, they ended up creating their own like women's empowerment group at the company, which is super cool. But mm -hmm. the very first meeting, like the company didn't really know that they were doing this. They just kind of invited people like ad hoc. Um, and they just say, hey, we're going to have a little pizza party. We're going to get together in the conference room. They reserved the conference room. They, you know, paid for the pizza out of their own pockets. And they just, you know, had a good time. Um, it's great. So often we as professionals might think like, ah, you know, I got to pay for that pizza or like, ah, I got to like coordinate this, all this sort of, like we come up with our own hurdles for why not to do it. But it's like, yeah you know, okay, they bought three pizzas that might have been like 40 bucks worth of pizza. But if that $40 worth of pizza ends up facilitating and fostering a really great conversation around how we can empower women within the workplace, or just any cause or conversation you want to discuss at work, that is work relevant and appropriate, like, shoot, that's a great starting point. And if your company gets wind of it, if your company doesn't support you, then maybe that company might not be the right fit for you to be at. Agreed. I actually have a great story along those lines. So Tell me. Um, in 2015, I realized that women in our organization were making up like only 20% of the organization at that time. And it was low. And construction industry, very male dominated. The guys in our office had plenty of opportunities to go golf and get out. And the women were feeling left out. So I started a women's networking group within the organization and I just brought everybody together in the conference room and we drank wine. I brought a couple of different brown bags of wine and we passed them around and did a blind tasting. And that was the start of what became an, like a quarterly get together for the women in our office. And after a couple sessions, we decided to start bringing in speakers and we would ask people to just come and donate their time because I didn't have a budget and I wasn't going to ask for it. And so after a year of this, and we had had some really wonderful speakers coming in, our team of women was more connected than ever. And I hadn't told anybody at the executive level that we were doing it. We were just doing it after hours. And I was taking over the conference room. The next year, my CEO came to me and said, I've been hearing about what you were doing. And while I think it's wild and crazy that you've been able to do it without a budget, I want to give you a budget of 10 grand. And I want you to do this the right way because there's value in it and I'm hearing about it 
from all these different people in all these directions. So I, again, I don't think you need to ask for validation for everything you do. If you're in the type of organization that values people as their greatest asset and wants your people to be uh, happy in their role, they're going to support moves like that. I love that. That's a cool story. That's a really cool story. Um, I mean, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. I think yes. that's like the, the, you know, if I summed it up in a real quick, uh, you know, saying that's awesome. It's I love hard that. to do. That's, that's one of those things though. I think you learn over time and you learn as you get your legs under you and you build your confidence as a leader that it's really okay to just beg for forgiveness. I, ha I struggled with that when I was early on in my career. And I felt like I needed the validation from people to before I could make moves. So just a, a piece of advice is, you know, start slow with that as well and give yourself the, the time to ramp up and know that that's something that I think even very seasoned leaders are continually reminding themselves of is I, I have the confidence to do this myself and I'll ask for forgiveness if something goes sideways. Well, and that's the the huge key in all of that, and the com is the confidence. Do you have yes. confidence in your own abilities? Like, if God forbid you were to get fired because you started a cool organization that you thought would be beneficial to the business, and for whatever re like the here's an example of like the a backfired example of that, but I think it, it worked out really wonderfully for this young gentleman. This this guy worked for. Um, some paint company. I, I can't remember what paint company it was. Um, what he would do is he'd make these TikTok videos where he'd mix different paints together and then like mix them around in some funky way to create some cool design and artistic like thing. And he ended up getting like millions of views on his TikTok videos. Um, but eventually he got word to like the C-suite level of the organization and they essentially fired him. They said, Hey, you can't be creating these, um, uh, you know, videos with our company paint doing it this way. And uh, so they let him go. But because he had gotten such a huge following, like their immediate competitor immediately made a massive offer to this guy and said, hey, you are going to be director of TikTok and like just run our entire division of just, he, you'll give you all the paint that you need to make these videos and just go. And it was really cool to, uh, I don't know, it's really cool to see that. So the point is, is that if you're doing something that's positively helping the organization and you're an organization that can support that, you're going to be in a position to thrive and succeed. I agree with you hundred percent. And I think confidence is the key in all of that. And, you know, I think a lot of people have heard of imposter syndrome where you've been elevated to a role and you don't necessarily have the confidence or agree that you should be in the role that you're in. And I think that gets into a lot of people's head and prevents them from kind of capitalizing on the opportunities that are present. And um, that's something that I have struggled with at different points throughout my career. And, and it's a challenge, but, but the key is knowing your self-worth, knowing that you're intelligent and educated and that if you're in an organization that isn't valuing the contributions that you're making positively, then you're not in the right place culturally. So let's talk about this transition to management. I mean, I think we've given some really cool stories and examples about what we can do to showcase our abilities of being a leader at work. But let's talk about the actual transition itself. Let's say we've gotten tapped to be a manager. Awesome. Amazing. We're excited. We got that promotion. We got that bonus. We've got a now group of direct reports. We're really excited. But then it actually comes to the work itself. Like we've seen all these bad managers in our life, all these people that we thought were horrible bosses. Now we're the boss. How can we, how can we avoid being the people that we didn't want to be? Like, I think it's so yeah. easy to criticize managers because we're not in that position. It's almost like as if we assume they're there to sabotage us. And it's like, no, no manager is out there to be a bad manager. Most bad managers think they're good managers. But I'd be curious to know, in your perspective, why is transitioning to management so difficult? So I think it's a shift in your mind that has to happen. And that shift doesn't happen easily for everybody. And the shift is going from managing projects or responsibilities to managing people. And that comes with a different set of responsibilities, a different skill set, and also different expectations with yourself about what success looks like. So, and I see this a lot with my team as they're transitioning from, from actual doers into managers. 
how you measure yourself changes. So if you're a doer, you have a task or responsibility list that's long. And every time you get to check something off of the list, you get the gratification of completing a project. And you get to look back at that project and say, I have completed X, Y, and Z since the last time we checked in. When you're a manager, it's the soft skills that matter. So it's no longer about completing tasks or projects. It's about empowering your team. It's about building the, the right team. It's about problem solving with your team. And those are soft skills that don't look like much on paper if you're checking off responsibilities, but they matter so much more. So you have to shift, in my opinion, how you measure yourself and how you define your worth in your organization um, to really thinking about it in terms of how you've empowered people rather than what you've accomplished on paper. How can we check ourselves though on that? I think it's really, I think like, I think there's a lot of leaders that understand like the book definition of what a leader means. They've gone to the conferences, they've gone to the trade shows, they've, li they've listened to the great speakers talk about what it means to be a leader. And if you were to ask them, they might recite some really great diatribe about what it means to be an incredible leader and all these sorts of things like give credit and take um, blame or, you know, all these sorts of things. But then when it comes to the actual application of it, sometimes things fall flat. How can we audit ourselves? How can we check ourselves to make sure that if what we're doing is not in line with our idealized leadership style, how can we make sure that we get ourselves back on track? Lots of things, but I think 360 degree feedback, meaning, so as a manager, talk to your manager and find out what they see you doing well and not. Talk to your direct reports constantly and ask them for feedback. And if they're not sharing feedback with you, hire a third party to help you facilitate that feedback so that you're getting unbiased opinions and not just hearing what you think your, your employee wants to hear. Um, I think those are all critical things. In, but sometimes yeah. though, we have to give negative feedback. Sometimes we got to tell people when they're yes. not doing things the way that we want them to do it. How, what is the best way to give feedback to somebody in, in a way that, you know, we're asking them to change the way that they've done something. Maybe they didn't do something the way we wanted them to do it. How do you give that kind of constructive criticism? So one of my mentors always told me to use the kiss, kick, kiss philosophy. So if you're gonna share feedback first, make an intro that is kind, that's building somebody up, that's sharing something that they've done well, then share the negative feedback and round it out with something that's positive to end it. That philosophy is something that I followed early on in my career. It's not something that I follow today at all, to be honest. Okay. So <laughs> another way philosophy... I've heard that is uh, calling it a shit sandwich. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you know, you yes. got a nice bun, shit, yes. bun. There you go. Kiss, kiss, kiss. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. But but I I take a little bit of a different approach right now. Yeah. So honesty is what it comes down to for me. So when I see my team doing something great, I'm going to praise them and I'm going to praise them publicly so everybody can see it. And I'm going to do that in the moment when it's happening. And I'm building trust with them and letting them know that, that they are valued and appreciated when they do something well. So that when something doesn't go well, that foundation is already built and you honestly tell them exactly what, you, what happened and what were, went wrong in a matter of fact way. No sugarcoating it, no putting the cherry on the top. Just talk real human to human um, and follow it up. The next time they do something well, or if they correct that behavior, then you praise it again. And I, I, it's the same philosophy, except my, my thought is, why are we sugarcoating this? Why something that they did great another time? Let's just be real and have a human to human, honest conversation about what's not working and be transparent rather than trying to fluff it up. And I think what's also really critical is that when you're giving this feedback, you're critiquing the action, not the person. Correct. So when you're giving that feedback, it's really critical that you're not saying like, hey, Johnny, you're a jerk. You're saying, hey, Johnny, the way you treated our vendor in that scenario um, left a, a bad impression in that vendor's mind and perspective and moving forward, X, Y, Z needs to happen. Right, and make it actionable. So tell them the behavior that you would like to see or the action that needs to come out of it rather than dwelling on the situation that happened and the error that was made. The other thing is timeliness. I, nothing makes me crazier than somebody coming to me and saying, 
this happened six months ago and I've been stewing over it and now I want to deal with it. If, if something happens, address it when it's happening in the moment, it's much easier than trying to go back and correct something after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, that follows a lot of kind of, have you read the book, Kim, Kim Scott's book, Radical Candor? Not. It's a good book. I've heard a lot about it. It follows a lot of that same sentiment of challenging directly and caring personally, but when you, when you're giving feedback that you give it back immediately and you're, you're specific and explicit about it. You're not, you know, I think the example she gives in her book was um, she, she worked at Google and there was a scenario where like the CEO or a senior level product manager was giving praise to a certain product team. And it was really only three core people who worked on this project, but there was 15 people on this team. He's like, Hey, you know, to the XYZ project team, great work, awesome stuff. And the three people who did the most of the work were kind of frustrated because, you know, the other 12 people are getting credit for not really doing anything on this project that they worked so hard on. Right. Um, That's wild. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's an interesting point. I, and I like it. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, have, so could you share with us a story of when you observed good management versus bad management and kind of like how they compare? Sure. So one of the things that I've noticed in our organization that hasn't been great is, and I hit on this a little bit, is our organization tends to praise and judge people behind their backs. And, um, and I've been victim of that as well. So if I did something great, my manager maybe would tell, tell another executive in the firm, but would never actually tell me to my face that I did a job well done. And similarly, if I've done something wrong, I wouldn't know, but somebody else in the organization would know and find out and share it back with me. And, and that has been maybe the single biggest learning lesson for me as a manager is anything that I'm going to say to somebody else about somebody else, I need to be willing to say to that person's face. So I am very clear on that. Having been through that experience, I think that bad management can be chalked up to not having the courage to tell somebody exactly what's happening or where they stand, whether positive or negative. Um, and on the flip side, good management to me is all about good communication and personal care for the people that work with you. Um, I believe that, and, and I've seen this firsthand, caring for somebody outside of, outside of the office in terms of what's happening in their life, what their activities and hobbies are, what's happening in their family, just taking a personal interest in the people that you work with and understanding what's happening in their life um, leads to understanding what's happening in the office and translates into things that are happening at work. So I think having watched both good and bad, the single greatest thing you can do as a manager is care for the people that are on your team and be interested and inquisitive and take an interest in what's happening with them. And you will instantly develop a, a relationship based on trust that will carry you into a strong working relationship. I love that. I think that's, I think that's so the power of curiosity. I think curiosity is one of the most yes. critical strengths anybody could possibly have. Um, if you have it, you're really going to level yourself up, not only as a manager, but just as a human being in general, because people love when others are genuinely curious into what they have to do because people care about yes. themselves. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and also along those lines, right. As a manager, your job is, is to poke and ask questions and sit back and listen. And if you're doing all the talking, in my opinion, you're not a great manager. All you're trying to do is extract information from people and listen to it because that teaches you so much about who they are and how they respond in situations. Oh, that's almost like a talk audit. Like when you think about your meetings, like think about it, break it down. What percentage of the time were you talking? What percentage of the time was everybody else talking? If I, even if I'm leading the team, I'm talking more than 50% of that time, I might not be listening enough. Yes, I think it should be about 30%. Oh, okay, cool. And I seventy percent listening. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. I love to just take a moment to ask the audience a question, real quick. What you know, in terms of the characteristics of good managers versus bad managers, share it in the comment section. I'd love to learn what do you, what have you seen with good managers? What have you seen with bad managers? Post in the comment section. I'd love to learn about that. Um, 
So Ali, I I think one thing that I, I'm I'm fascinated to learn about is the power of vulnerability within management. What are your thoughts on that? How does that play in? Are you open to being vulnerable with your team? Like, how does that all work with you? So yes, is the simple answer. And, and it comes pretty naturally for me, but I've watched many of my executive counterparts struggle with this. I think one of the greatest things you can do as a leader is admit your faults and admit them publicly so that you, the rest of your organization can see that you're a human, that you're not a robot, and that it's okay and it's a safe place to make mistakes. That is one of the main reasons that I have loved staying at my organization is because it is, it is okay and it, it is safe to fall flat on your face and get back up and admit that you did that and move forward. And when I do that, if I am leading a project and that project ultimately fails, I'm gonna be the one taking responsibility for that, not my team members who are involved in it. That teaches them to do the same. Many many, many employees are emulating the behavior of their manager, whether it's good or bad. And so by, by being vulnerable, by opening yourself up both to feedback and to criticism and trying to continually learn and get better is setting an example for how you want the rest of your organization to conduct themselves as well. So I actually think it's critical and, and one of the biggest pillars that shapes the culture of an organization. And it starts with your CEO and it trickles all the way down. Do you like set aside dedicated vulnerability time with your team or is it only like on a case by case basis? So this is, that's actually a really good question. I think the pandemic has made it much easier to be vulnerable. I think for me anyways, pre pandemic, when I was in the office five days a week, trying to juggle work-life balance, I have two little kids at home. I felt like I had to put on more of a facade that everything was put together, that everything is okay. I think that the pandemic has broken down some of those barriers and people are more willing to be vulnerable about the, um, let's call it the shit show that work-life balance truly is. And, and I appreciate that. And I personally have leaned into that. So to answer your question, I do not carve out time to be vulnerable. I am doing that every day in every conversation with my team, with my kids running around in the background, um, if I'm late for a meeting because something has gone awry, I'm not sugarcoating it and giving them an excuse. I'm telling them exactly why and what's happening, which gives them insight into what's happening with me so that if I then snap or I'm having a bad day, they also understand me in the same way that I'm trying to understand them. So I think vulnerability weaves into pretty much every conversation you have as a manager. And it's, I don't think there's a time and a place for it. I think it should be always. Yeah, I love that. I think um, it's so easy, though. It's easy to fall into that trap. I think like naturally we have this perspective of wanting to convey that everything's going amazing. Um, this just like, hey, everything's going awesome mentality, but not everything's going awesome all the time. And when that's happening, it's it's really critical that we we obviously with the people that are relying on us and are seeing us in, in our physical state, it's critical that we communicate to them what might be going on, because if we don't, they might think it's on them. They might take it personally. They may feel like we are personally frustrated at them when we're really frustrated with something going on in our personal life. I, I'd love to ask the audience another yeah. just quick question, like how has vulnerability played a role in your management style or with manage, managers that you've interacted with? Post in the comment section. I'd love to learn more about that. Um, I've so got just like, a quick, a really quick story on that. Yeah, jump in. I hope this will make the audience laugh. So at the very beginning of COVID, when I was still trying to uh, keep things nice and tight and organized as, as a leader, and I'm down here working in my basement and my son, who was four at the time, um, was home from school because we were in lockdown and he came running into the basement while I was leading a call with, with their entire executive team. And he was completely naked and I had my background blurred. So I was hoping that he wouldn't be seen. And sure enough, he came right into the middle of the camera, totally unblurred, did himself a little dance for the entire executive team and then ran out of there. And it made our entire executive team crack up laughing. And then everybody started going into stories about when they remember their kid being young and how fast the time goes. And Allowing the opportunities for life to get in the way of work like that and to happen allows you to connect with people at just 
at a different level. Um, it kind of breaks down some of those barriers. So I would, I would highly encourage if you're one of the people who is trying to keep the facade of everything being professional, allow yourself to dabble in, in a little bit more of those human characteristics with your colleagues at work. I think it goes a really long way. That's awesome. I, uh, that's a really funny story and that's cool. I, I think that's, that's really powerful because I think it shows a lot more about who we are. And um, I, I think that can apply to other things though, beyond that. I think it's easy to use COVID as like our excuse for why uh, some things are not going the way we wanted to, but I think we should begin begin feeling more comfortable with using vulnerability in other areas of our life too, or like within work as well. Like even if we are back in the office, because I know there are some people that are back in the office. And so it, it, they may, other people may not realize that if you maybe do have children, you, you have to pay for childcare. You got to pick your kids up at some place at some time. And that causes you to have to leave work early on certain days of the week because you're trying to do childcare at the same time as doing your job. And um, absolutely. If you keep trying to come up with some professional excuse for why you're having to leave, it's not not doing you any justice and not doing them any justice. And so it's it's better just to be just fully transparent about what's going on. Agreed. 100%. Um, well, cool. Well, Allie, this has been a really awesome workshop. Um, you know, one last question I'd love to ask the audience. What were what was one of your biggest takeaways from some of Allie's stories from today? Post in the comment section. I'd love to learn about that. Um but my last question is, what is your, what's, what's one final piece of advice, final piece of just information or nuggets that you'd love to share with our audience um, as they transition into management or they transition into their early roles that might end up being management? What, what, uh, what final advice would you have for our audience? I guess my final piece of advice would be management to me is all about people. So uh, if you're still in school or interested in this, I think take a psychology class, take a communication class, because as I mentioned, so much of, of what you will do as a manager and an, an executive and a leader is coaching people to, to achieve results rather than trying to achieve results yourself. Um, and, and remind yourself that management, first of all, isn't always for everybody. There's, there are people who are very technically skilled that, that don't have the people skills to translate into management. And, and it's okay to take those different tracks. And so I would just say, if, if management is the next step in your career, focus and give yourself the time and energy to read books, to listen to podcasts, to, to participate in leadership workshops, and try to soak up all of the knowledge that you can to focus on people rather than to focus on tasks. I love that. Focus on people, not just on tasks. That's a really good piece yeah. of advice, Allie. Um, all right. Well, this is an awesome workshop. Well, one final question. How can our audience learn more about you, Allie? How can they connect with you and your work? Are you okay with them connecting with you on LinkedIn? Absolutely. You can find me on LinkedIn. I can also share my email address. It's abedwell at skylineenterprises.com. And I would love to hear from you guys. It would be great to, to have a conversation and dialogue after this. Perfect. Awesome. Well, Allie, thanks for being here. Everybody in our, our audience, thank you for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. See everybody.